And when I first arrived in India, I went to the Himalayas and I took on the life of a sadhu, wearing sadhu robes. I had a little begging pot and I was traveling through the jungles and the <coughs> mountains of Himalayas and meeting many great rishis, yogis, sages, living at their ashrams, learning from them. Um, I was also living sometimes in caves with yogis in the jungles. Sometimes I was living in caves in seclusion myself, just practicing various meditations. I lived at Buddhist monasteries, studying Buddhism under Rinpoches and Lamas. And in this way I was traveling around India um, looking for God-realization. Each place, everyone wanted to initiate me because to have a foreign disciple was very prestigious for yogis, gurus, lamas, rinpoches, and all of these other spiritual personalities. But I had felt in my heart that until I find a guru who I am convinced I will never leave for my whole life, I cannot accept initiation. So I was learning and I was very favorable wherever I learned and traveling. And at one point I came to Bombay. I went there in order to try to get a renewal on my visa. So one day I was walking down the street in Bombay and I saw a big, big sign and it said Hare Krishna Festival. And under it it said at Cross Maidan. So I asked someone, where is this Cross Maidan? And they told me where. So I went and there was a big, big pandal and many devotees. And they told me that their Guru Maharaj was going to be speaking that night. So I stayed there and talked with devotees. I was reading Prabhupada's books during the day. And then Srila Prabhupada and all the devotees went on the stage. And there was thousands and thousands of people. There must have been 10, 15,000 people, maybe more. And I was a very insignificant sadhu. I had matted hair, begging pot, river-stained clothes. And I was way in the back of this massive crowd. And the devotees were chanting on stage, having kirtan. And Prabhupada was in the middle of the stage, sitting on a vyasasan. And one devotee, Guru Das, he came all the way through all the crowds and he came to me and he took me by the hand and he said, Srila Prabhupada wants you to sit beside him. I said, how does Srila Prabhupada know me? And Guru Das didn't say anything. He just said, he wants you to sit beside him. So we went through all these thousands and thousands of people and I came up on the stage and I, and Srila Prabhupada looked at me and he smiled and he went like this, that you sit here. So I came and I sat just a few feet away from his Vyasasan. And there was a beautiful kirtan. I remember Madhubhista Swami was leading the kirtan. And all the devotees had clean shaved heads, beautiful clean sar dhotis and saris. And I had these river stained sadhu clothes with holes in them and matted hair down practically to my waist. I was a sadhu, <laughs> at least trying to be. And I was just thinking, why has he called me here? I'm not a good image <laughs> for you know, how he appears with all of his devotees. But he smiled upon me very graciously and encouraged me. After the temple was purchased on Wat Seka, I was transferred from Laguna to Los Angeles. I was living on La Cienega Boulevard. My service was, the first service they gave me was working with Bhavananda to prepare Srila Prabhupada's quarters for him to live in them. So I was painting, and hammering nails and sanding and preparing his room. So I believe the first time he really may have noticed me was when he moved into his apartment and the crew that had been there working, we were there to greet him. And I never forget that he sat down behind his desk and he pulled out a bag of cookies and he handed each of us a cookie. And we ate the cookie and then he said, now you must go wash your hands and feet. You must always do this after eating. 
And shortly after that, there was an incident that I remember fondly. It was one Sunday, um, the Sunday feast was on La Siegana Boulevard, but after the feast, I came back to work, and at that time I was painting in the ceiling of the temple room. And I was working on a scaffold, and I thought I was the only one in the temple, and I was singing Hare Krishna Mantra quite loudly, and not paying too much attention to anything else, chanting and painting. I happened to glance down, and Srila Prabhupada was standing on the floor, surrounded by the temple president, who's Gargamuni and Karandar, and I think Brahmananda was there. And I was stunned. So I scampered down from this um, scaffold, and I offered my obeisances to Srila Prabhupada, and I was kneeling on the floor with my hands folded in front of him, and he looked at me, and he folded his hands, and he said, Thank you very much. And Afterwards, the devotees told me that when they had brought Srila Prabhupada over from the temple, and they told me that when they drove up, they could hear me singing, and Srila Prabhupada had asked them to be quiet, and they listened to my chanting as they walked into the temple, and they'd been listening as, I, as I'd been painting, and they were watching down below. So Srila Prabhupada appreciated the loud chanting. <laughs> we wanted to start a, an incense business in Toronto, and Jagadish sent me down to L.A. to Jayatirtha to learn the incense business from him. And since I knew Prabhupada was going to be in, in Rathiatra in San Francisco, just prior to that, I asked if I could go a little early so I might be able to see him, because none of us had ever seen him. And uh, so he said, all right. So I went to uh, the Rathiatra in San Francisco when they had the funeral home and actually spent a whole day driving around with, who's that famous Rathiatra devotee that died? Jayananda. Jayananda. We spent a whole day together driving around watching, we were collecting donations and things. So I got to hang out with him during Rathiatra, for which he is the most famous, you know. And uh, finally the day came when Prabhupada was coming in. We all went to the airport and there was, there was hundreds of us. And we were waiting anxiously and the plane was late. And we were in the waiting room just at the doors where the people come off the plane. And it was interesting because there was a, a kind of a, uh, what do you call it, a divider there. So you couldn't actually see the people walking up the hallway. You could just see them all coming out from either side. And we waited and waited, and I think the plane was 20 minutes late, so it just intensified our anxiety and, and, and anticipation. And, you know, f many of us hadn't seen Prabhupada, and I was just wondering, you know, what's it going to be like when I finally see him, because I'd seen so many pictures. And the plane landed, and then everything built up. It became more intense, and we were chanting. And then all of a sudden, the first passengers started coming off. And, of course, they were shocked, because they saw all these devotees there. It was like, oh, my God, what's going on here? And the devotees that were closest to the divider were the ones that were going to see him first. And finally, after a certain number of people came off, you could just feel a wave as they saw Prabhupada coming and, and they got excited and it built up and it kind of just like a wave through and then Prabhupada came around the divider and as soon as I saw him, tears poured from my eyes. I just, just flowed like a water faucet and I was just, it was so unbelievable. I was just so, it was so good. And then I just paid my obeisances and I just cried. And I was just so happy. It was wonderful. And then he gave his lecture. And after the lecture, he started to walk to the stairs going down from the stage. And as he walked by me, I went to touch his feet. Because traditionally, as I was taught, you're supposed to touch a holy man's feet and place the dust upon your head. So when I reached out to touch his feet, one of his very senior disciples chastised me. He yelled at me. He said, no one is allowed to touch Srila Prabhupada's feet. So being very embarrassed, I pulled my hand back. And Prabhupada looked at me, and he smiled. And then he gave me the first instruction he ever gave me in my life. He said, you can touch my feet. So I reached and touched his lotus feet and placed the dust on my head. And then he smiled very mercifully and told me, you come and sit here every night. In those days, he would come on Monday evenings to La Sierra Temple and give a lecture. And we would be always waiting outside. All the devotees would line the sidewalks. And when he drove up, we'd all bow down. And Srila Prabhupada walked down the line of devotees. 
Sometimes he'd pat a devotee on the head, and sometimes he wouldn't. And you were always trying to understand whether he was accepting your service or not. And it, it seems that if he patted you, you felt that I'm not worthy, he's just giving me some encouragement. And if he wouldn't, you felt the same thing. <laughs> Um, there was another incident, and in, once we moved, we moved into the new temple on Watsika Avenue, and Sri the Prabhupada was giving Sri Upanishad classes every day. And one incident, which is pretty famous, is that he asked after 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 the class one day, he asked, "Is everyone chanting 16 rounds?" And I was pretty naive, and I raised my hand. I said, "Sri the Prabhupada, I'm not chanting." 16 rounds. And Sri the Prabhupada looked at me. Oh, why? Why you're not chanting 16 rounds? Uh, Sri the Prabhupada, I'm working 20 hours a day, and the temple president doesn't give me sufficient time to chant. Then sleep two hours. Chant 16 rounds. And you could hear the shudder in the devotees' hearts. Later I found that pr pretty much no one was chanting 16 rounds because it was the philosophy of the leaders that work was more important than chanting. And of course, Srila Prabhupada strongly said, don't diminish your work in the, for the chanting, diminish your sleep. And so I took it seriously and I would spend my late night standing in the hot water closet trying to finish my rounds. We had a temple president who was artificially austere, Dharmaraj always making us eat little, just, you know, to, to be austere. And we were always in anxiety and would always pig out at the feast. And every, like everyone else, we were addicted to halava. There was just something about halava that was irresistible. So we were going to Detroit, and he, we didn't eat very much that day, and he made this huge thing of halava, but he wouldn't let us eat any. So all the way down, all I was thinking about was halava. And it was right there, and I was trying to steal some, you know, and eat it. And I was in total anxiety. I'm thinking, here I am going to see the spiritual master, my, a pure devotee, and I'm thinking of halava. So I was so ashamed of myself, but I was ang in anxiety. So finally we got there, and then they said, we need some, Prabhupada's going to stay in this devotee's parents' house. We need some volunteers to clean the house. Who wants to volunteer? And everybody's putting up their hand. And I thought, oh, well, put up your hand, you stupid idiot. You know, I mean, don't be a sourpuss. So I went, so they picked me. Meanwhile, my service at the temple had been cleaning the bathroom. And I had a lot of realizations cleaning the bathroom. I just surrendered, and I got into it, and I made it like a real you know, good service, and I just accepted it, you know, that I was a toilet cleaner. So I would clean the bathroom very thoroughly, and I just became proud of being a toilet cleaner, you know, and I thought about the Gita a lot. So I made a lot of spiritual advancement in the bathroom. And uh, when I went to the house, they said, okay, we need somebody to clean the bathroom. I said, me. So that was, pr I was in ecstasy, cleaning the bathroom. I felt like I'd been trained for this. <laughs> so when Prabhupada finally came, they had this huge plate of fruit and everything, and and we sat down with Prabhupada, and he said, we'll have some, and we're kind of picking at it. Like the Prabhupada said, never be shy in business or eating, prashadam. So mm. we just ate, and I never forgot that. So I was never shy from that point on in business or prashadam. I had known already so many of the residents of Vrindavan, and they told me that Swami Bhaktivedanta is living at Sharaf Bhavan, one very wealthy man's house with his disciples. So I went there to meet Srila Prabhupada. And when I arrived, it was the early morning, and Srila Prabhupada was giving Srimad Bhagavatam class. And I remember he was chanting Jai Radha Madhava. And as he was chanting, I was appreciating like I had never appreciated anything in my whole life. I was thinking that the gravity, the intensity of the devotion in which he was chanting Krishna's names, I had never seen anywhere. I had met so many of the greatest yogis, the greatest gurus of the Himalayas, many great Christian saints, Muslim saints. For six months I was traveling through Vrindavan, meeting all of the Babaji's, so many of his god brothers, so many of the very famous Vrindavasi saints, but I had never seen such a depth of love and compassion in Srila Prabhupada as he was chanting Radha Madhava. My heart completely transformed. And then he gave his lecture. And when he spoke, every question I ever had was answered in one lecture. He spoke in such a way that 
everything I had ever learned in every religion I felt was included within his message, plus something far more that was sublime. And it was at that time, sitting at his feet in Vrindavan, that in my heart I accepted this is my spiritual master and I must surrender my life to him. I distinctly uh, remember my initiation, of course, because um, it was something you dream of and pray for and wait for for innumerable lifetimes. But it, in particular, when Srila Prabhupada was there, and, and he said, Bill Prabhu, come forward. And he said, your name is Bhakta Das handed me my beads, and he, he said, this name means that you are the servant of the devotees. The more you think of yourself as a servant, the more you will advance in spiritual life. The more you think you're becoming a master, the faster you will go to hell. So in that one sentence, he pretty much summarized the essence of Krishna consciousness philosophy, and over the years, I meditate on it over and over and over again and have attempted to uh, serve the devotees from whatever means I can and I've found that it is without any doubt the mercy of the devotees um, that helps one to advance in spiritual life much more than the mercy of Krishna. You know, our philosophy is that we get the mercy of Krishna is to get our guru the mercy of the guru or the mercy of the devotees is to get Krishna. And we oftentimes, of course, in the neophyte stage, Kanishta level of devotees, we worship the deity and we neglect the devotees. Or we give respect to the, quote, big devotees, swamis, gurus, but we neglect the, the, the ordinary devotees. And in this way, you know, I think, I know I'm guilty of every variety of offense, but you know, I keep hearing these words of Srila Prabhupada again and again, echoing in my mind, become the servant of the devotees. And I finally concluded that the highest service is to serve the newest devotee, the youngest devotee, because he's taken the bold step to try to leave the material world. And if you help him, then you're really helping the Krishna consciousness movement. Because the people that are already mature in devotional service, of course, don't need so much help. Normally, probably in about 90% of the time, Prabhupada would give a name that had the first letter of your Western name. So I thought being Ron, my name would be Ram or something like that. But instead, Prabhupada gave me the name Uttama Shloka. And he said to me, your name is Uttama Shloka, Krishna who is praised with transcendental songs. I had been a musician and, uh, you know, I had enjoyed some local you know, notoriety, and wanted in the beginning to use my musical abilities to serve Krishna, writing songs and whatnot. And I always wanted to do something like that. And when Prabhupada gave me that name and said, Krishna who is praised with transcendental songs, I, I just was in ecstasy. I thought it was wonderful, you know. So, you know, I thought that was very special. And then again, I got Gayatri at the same time, so Prabhupada spoke it into my ear personally. So that was also auspicious. And then Srila Prabhupada every day would take us on Parikrama to many of the holy places. He took us to Govardhan and Badarsana and Nandagaon. He took us to um, the various places in Vrindavan, Radha Damodar Temple, Radha Govindaji Temple. And I remember especially one day he took us to Mahavan, Gokul, and he took us to Brahmandagat. And Brahmandagat is the place where Krishna was accused of eating dirt. And then he opened his mouth and Mother Jashoda saw the universe. I remember Srila Prabhupada so animately telling that story right at the place. He was telling the stories where, wherever he would take us. And then he told us to take bath in, in the Jamuna. So all the devotees were inviting Prabhupada to also take bath in Jamuna. But Srila Prabhupada said, today I am very sick and I cannot take baths, but you all go and enjoy a nice bath in Jamuna. So all the devotees were in Jamuna and he was on the steps, quite high over the river. And he was just watching all the devotees enjoying the wonderful ambrosial waters of Jamuna. And he was just smiling, looking at us. And he became so ecstatic just to see all the devotees bathing that he very quickly got up and took off his clothes and put on gumsha 
and came down to take bath with us in Jamuna. And devotees were very ecstatic, very happy. Everyone was gathered around him, and devotees were even bathing him like an Abhishek with Jamuna water. And Srila Prabhupada was just very happy to be bathing in the Jamuna along with his disciples in the holy land of Vrindavan. Once I was in San Diego and I became temple president and I started having to write to him once a month and give a, um, supposed to, each temple president was supposed to write every month and give Srila Prabhupada a report on the activities of the particular center. So I, I started writing my first letter, I believe in January of 1971. I was so nervous, I agonized over every word, every comma, wanting to try and make it perfect. It probably took me weeks to write the letter. And Srila Prabhupada wrote back and he said, it appears Krishna has his blessings on you. Now you just make sure that all of our principles are followed and then there will never be any scarcity. So I found that to be invaluable instruction and I still try to live by that. that we should have faith that Krishna will maintain and protect his devotees if we are obedient um, to our spiritual master. I had found a building in Toronto uh, a big church on Avenue Road, which is a very, very good location and a huge building, wonderful building and perfect. And this Christian group was moving out to a new place and it was for sale for a half a million. And uh, ev all the realtors kept telling us about this place. So it, there was all this attention focused on it and it was the best place we had found in years of looking. So I went to Prabhupada and I told him, you know, about the building. And they introduced Prabhupada. This is the temple president from Toronto, Uttama Shloka. Prabhupada, we found this building. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's this huge church. The temple room is like 40 feet high ceilings. Uh, there's space for brahmachari quarters. I mean, I described everything to him and he said, sounds great. Uh, how much do they want? And I said, well, they want 500,000. And we had never paid that much for a building. And he said, hmm, that's a lot of money. You know, what's the use of buying anxiety? You know? You just then you're, all you're thinking about is collecting money. You know, we don't need to purchase anxiety. That's not our business. Our business is, you know, to remember Krishna and, and that's all. So it's a good location? I said, Oh yes, Prabhupada. Of good condition? Oh, beautiful Prabhupada. It's on this main road. Everybody drives Ah, but what's the use of purchasing anxiety? It's you know, we don't need that. You know, it's not we don't want to purchase anxiety. I said, Yeah, okay. Mm. Big temple room? Yes, Prabhupada. Nice temple room. Wonderful. Maybe you could come to Toronto and see it. Maybe we'll come, you know. Okay. Um, now, I can't remember if he, if he asked to see me again. I don't think he asked to see me again. Maybe once more, but I can't remember. So anyway, uh, he finally came to Toronto uh, about three weeks later, after Philadelphia. He wasn't going to come, then he was, then he wasn't. Meantime, I took over Chicago, but because I was still in Toronto, I got to host him with Vishwakarma. So we picked him up at the airport and drove home in the car, and he said, uh, you know, can we go see the building? And I said, sure. You know, we arranged to go see it, and they had already moved out. So we drove him over to the building, and we took him on a tour, and there was one of the Christian guys left there. And we're looking around, and I'm telling him, and here's the temple room, and here's the prasadam room, and this, and we'll do this here and that there, and I got it all worked out, and yada, yada, yada. And then uh, we're walking by this table, and they've got some leftover books, and one of them says, what does God look like? Prabhupada looks at it, and he picks it up, and he said, ask him if we can buy this. I said, can we buy this book? He said, you can have it. I said, okay. So we get in the car, and Prabhupada says, read something to me. Read the book. So I started reading the book, and it was just going nowhere. You know, he said, they don't know what God looks like. It's just a bluff. And then, uh, so we get back to the, uh, to the house, and it's getting later on in the day, and Prabhupada's thinking about it. And uh, so we're all excited from the day, and it's about 10 o'clock at night. And the phone call comes, Prabhupada wants to see you. Come over to the apartment right away. So I go over to the apartment, and he said, do you have all the plans, the blueprints, how you're going to lay it out and everything? Yes. Oh, yes, Prabhupada, I have everything. Um, he goes, I think this would be an ideal temple. I said, yes, Prabhupada, it would be, you know, wonderful. And then he says, uh, he said, how much do they want? I said, 500000 He goes, well, why don't we go there, and you ask if they'll take $300,000 uh, 
how much do you have? I said, well, we have about 40,000. He said, can you get another 60? I said, well, we can try. And he said, Brahmananda, how much do we have in the BBT? He said, well, we have, you know, 200 and something. He goes, give them 200,000. He goes, Prabhupada, we've never given that much at all to anybody. He goes, that's okay, give it to them and see if they'll take 300,000 cash and tell them we'll worship Lord Jesus next to Lord Krishna on the altar. So we'll preserve the Christian element, so to speak. And, uh, and he said, so do you think they'll do that? I said, well, we can only try. And I said, but, you know, he said, do you, can you handle the payments on 300000 I said, well, Prabhupada, that's an awful lot of money. I said, you know, we don't want to purchase anxiety. He goes, no, there must be anxiety. Otherwise, we'll simply be sitting around eating prasadam and getting fat. There must be anxiety. <laughs> he just slammed his fist on the table. I was like, okay. <laughs> Completely reversed what he said. Well, we don't want to purchase anxiety. There must be anxiety. <laughs> Everybody was shocked. Everybody was shocked. After the parikrama, in the morning every day, devotees would take prasad, and then Srila Prabhupada would have darshan in his room and meet his old friends from Vrindavan, his god-brothers, and so many others. Um, and I used to just sit there all afternoon with him and just watch him talking with his old Vrindavasi friends. And there was a rule that devotees were not supposed to be there because in the afternoon the devotees were supposed to do seva, doing Harinam, Sankirtan, and other services. So I would sit there, and one day, the regional manager of ISKCON for India at the time, he saw me sitting there with Srila Prabhupada. And at that time, it was just Prabhupada and myself in the room. And he said to me that no devotees are allowed to sit with Prabhupada during his darshan time. And I looked at Prabhupada, and Prabhupada looked at me. And then I said to this devotee, I said, but I'm not a devotee. <laughs> and I pointed to my matted hair. And then he looked at Prabhupada, and Prabhupada smiled. And then he left, and I got to stay with Prabhupada. <laughs> and I remember it was so beautiful seeing Prabhupada meet his old friends, especially Krishna Das Babaji. That was a beautiful sight. Krishna Das Babaji came to see Prabhupada. I remember, actually, I met him on the street and I told him that Prabhupada was here. So he said, take me. So I brought him. And while I was trying to bring him up the stairs to Prabhupada's room, one sannyasi disciple told him he wasn't allowed to come. He was actually ready to physically throw him out. I said, please ask Prabhupada if he wants to see him. And he went up and asked, and then he said, yes, he wants to see you. So he came into the room, and when Srila Prabhupada met him, he was, he was talk, Prabhupada was talking to a whole group of about 15 people. When Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj came into the room, Prabhupada's eyes just became filled with tears, and Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj's eyes became full of tears. And Prabhupada stood up, and Babaji Maharaj called out, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And Prabhupada practically ran to him and embraced him. And as they were embracing, they were just so affectionate. I had never seen in my entire life such affectionate and love between two people as Prabhupada was embracing his god-brother. And then Prabhupada took him with his arms around him to the seat where he would sit behind a little table. And they were both sitting together on this seat and they had their arms around each other, and they were talking in Bengali. And as they were talking, I couldn't understand, but Prabhupada was laughing so hard. Krishnadas Babaji kept saying these things, and Prabhupada was just laughing and laughing and laughing. <coughs> and every now and then they would slap each other on the legs. They were practically sitting on top of each other. And there was tears in their eyes. They were just so happy to be together discussing transcendental subject matters. And it was amazing because all these people in the room, Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj and Srila Prabhupada were completely oblivious to everyone. They were just in their own world. 
hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord together. I asked him, should I get married? Because I was a brahmachari, and within my mind, I, I was determined I'm going to remain a brahmachari in this life. I don't, I'd never had a girlfriend before I joined the movement. I felt that Krishna had protected me, and I felt that I could continue. And then some of our senior men in Los Angeles started telling me that I should marry various girls. And this just totally destroyed my mental equilibrium. I started thinking about getting married, and I asked him, and he said, as far as you're getting married is concerned, it is better if you can remain a brahmachari. But he didn't say no or yes. It wasn't specific. And eventually, uh, then there was some talk after this visit to San Diego in 1972, there was some talk that I should take sannyas. And then I had to really search in my heart um, where I'm at. And I concluded that you know every time a pretty girl walks in the temple, my mind would be attracted to her, or I'd think of her. And I said, I don't want to take sannyas under this condition. When I take sannyas, I want to be free of this. So I went and got married instead. And I've come to, uh, over the years, come to appreciate very much the mercy of the Grihasta Ashram, that Krishna is so kind to um, allow us that. And I think of those poor Mayavadis who must take sannyas, even though their hearts are full of so many desires. This particular uh, incident took place in Toronto, and I believe it was 1976. And uh, we were in the new temple there. I was president of Chicago, but I had been president of Toronto. Vishwakarma was then the president. So we were up there, because it was only the second time that Prabhupada had come there. And it was a morning walk, and I, I don't know why, but I didn't go on that morning walk. But after it was over, Vishwakarma came up to me to tell me what had gone down. And he told Prabhupada that, he said, Prabhupada, lately the brahmacharis are manifesting a lot of agitation. They're very disturbed, having difficulty maintaining their brahmachari mood. And we don't know what to do, how to deal with this. And Prabhupada said, well, if they're agitated, just get them, tell them to get married. What's the problem? And Vishwakarma said, well, but Prabhupada, you know, all the big devotees, the sannyasis, they tell them if they get married, they're going to be falling down. And Prabhupada said, how can you fall when you're already fallen? In other words, where do they think they're falling from, that they're so exalted? And he said, besides, the, the sannyasis are not the big devotees. A big devotee is somebody who's humble and sincere and serving Krishna. That's a big devotee, not a sannyasi. He said, I only give these, these guys sannyas because they keep bothering me. So just so they'll stop bothering me, I give them sannyas to, to get, you know, to leave me alone. The devotees thought that I should join the movement. They told me that Srila Prabhupada was going to be taking them to different places in India and that I should join them. And I explained that I have already made a decision that I'm never going to leave Vrindavan for my whole life. So they became very critical of me. They were calling me a Sahaja. They were calling me a smarter Brahmin. They were saying I was bogus. They were saying that Lord Chaitanya's movement is to preach. And I was thinking that they do not understand. These, these Western people, they do not understand what is Vrindavan. <laughs> they even offered me to be Srila Prabhupada's personal servant. Because they said that, that they were always getting sick in India, but I was very much um, accustomed to living in India. But I told them that, thank you very much for this wonderful offer, but I will serve Srila Prabhupada when he does something in Vrindavan. And they were very much criticizing me. In fact, they were harassing me. So one day, Srila Prabhupada gave a lecture in a garden. And as he was walking out from the lecture to his car, I had just arrived. And there was a crowds of people between his car and where he spoke. And they were all just bowing down to him as he was walking by. So I was one of those people in the crowd. And I bowed down just as Srila Prabhupada was walking by me. And then I got up. And when I got up, Srila Prabhupada was stopped right in front of me. So I looked up at him. I was on my knees. And Srila Prabhupada had a very serious expression on his face, very concerned. 
and he looked at me right in the eyes. And when he looked in my eyes, I could feel that he was looking right into my soul. I could actually feel my soul being touched by Srila Prabhupada's glance. I had never had a sensation like that in my entire life. And then Srila Prabhupada asked me, how long have you been living in Vrindavan? And I was thinking, oh no, all the devotees have been chastising me. <coughs> now Srila Prabhupada's going to chastise me. So very shy, I said, Srila Prabhupada, I've been here about six months. And Prabhupada just stood silently, just looking at me, penetrating me with his glance. It seemed like hours. Perhaps it was about 30 seconds. And then his face blossomed into the most beautiful ecstatic smile. And he said to me, very nice, Vrindavan is the most wonderful place. And then he rubbed me on the head and he walked by. And I was thinking at that time that everyone was chastising me for being in Vrindavan. But Prabhupada knew just what I had to hear to become attached to him. At that time I knew I was wrong and I was ready to go anywhere and do anything for him because I felt such a love, a, such an understanding, such a depth that he was willing to say whatever was required to encourage me to become more attached to him and more attached to devotional service. One letter he wrote me, this is actually rather interesting, it was in the middle of 1972, and at that time there were no, was no plain clothes Samkirtan, everything was straight out, saris, dhotis, tilak, here we're from Hare Krishna, please read a book about Krishna. But he wrote me a letter and he said, make sure that you sell books by preaching, not by cheating. So I was really taken aback by this. I said, well, you know, what does he mean when he says cheating? You know, what are we doing? <laughs> then I wrote and asked him, Prasila Prabhupada, you mentioned sell books by preaching, not by cheating. What exactly do you mean? His reply was that if if you act in consciousness that Krishna is the supreme proprietor, he is the only enjoyer, and he is the dearmost friend of all living beings, then you are never cheating. But if you act in any other consciousness, you are always cheating. So he didn't specifically address, you know, the uh, fact, oh, you're lying or something on Samkirtan to collect money to give out a book. But, you know, the way I took it is Krishna is within us. And when we're on Samkirtan, we should be trying to please the super soul within us, who's within all the people we're selling the books to. Prabhupada said, uh, he asked me if we were distributing the books. You're distributing the books? Is that going well? I said, yes, Prabhupada. We're distributing a lot of books. And I gave him the figures, and they were impressive. And he said, you're distributing the books, but are you reading them too? I said, oh, yes, Prabhupada. Every day we have four classes. And then he smiled at me like this big smile. It was almost like a surprise. And he said, oh thank you very much. And I just was washed with a, an incredible feeling of satisfaction that I had, you know, pleased him. And it was true because we would have nectar of devotion one day and then nectar of instruction the other day. We'd alternate and then do Bhagavatam. And then at night we'd have Krishna book, Chaitanya Charitamrita and Bhagavad Gita. And I told him that and he was very, very happy. And I just remember this big smile coming over his face. And he said, and the devotees, they're coming? And I said, well, not really. Maybe every six months a few people join. You know, he said, that's all right. Manushanam sahasreshu kaschid yatati siddhaye. He said, you know, out of thousands among men, maybe one is interested. And out of thousands of those, you know, maybe one becomes a devotee. So, that's all right. Don't worry about it. One day he was giving Srimad Bhagavatam class. And I remember he was saying, that you are all distributing my books. But my question is, are you reading my books? He said, if you go up to someone and try to convince them to buy the books, what happens if that person asks you, do you read these books? What is it about? And you tell him, I don't read these books, I only sell these books. He said, how will you convince them? 
unless you are convinced of the subject matter of these books by reading them carefully, how will you convince others to, be, to buy them? He was very strong telling all the book distributors that they have to very carefully read his books. At one time I had the idea, let's try and sell the books through the bookstores. And I went and had an um, advertisement produced for radio for the Krishna book and invested some Lakshmi in radio advertising and placed the Krishna books in all the bookstores in San Diego County. And I wrote, that, I wrote to Srila Prabhupada about that and he wrote back, this is very nice, if this, please let me know if this is successful because if it's successful we're prepared to spend millions and millions of dollars to advertise our books. And of course, you know, I didn't have enough finances to do it the way it should have been done. But it was effective, at least in the fact that it put the books into all the stores, got them on display, and it, made, it had some, and of course, some of them sold, but not enough in that time to justify the amount that we'd spent. But it, he, I think Srila Prabhupada liked the attempt to boldly do something. Um, someone told me, I heard this year that someone, Srila Prabhupada once told them, what it, he asked, what is humility? And Srila Prabhupada said, humility is to act boldly for Krishna. And we get the idea that humility is to be very meek and quiet or submissive. But no, Prabhupada didn't say that. He said, be bold for Krishna. After Srila Prabhupada left, it was announced that in August he would be coming to New Vrindavan for a special Bhagavad Dharma discourse where he would be speaking on a mountain and discussing Srimad Bhagavatam. And also he was going to celebrate John Mastami and Vyas Puja at, in Nubrindavan. So they were recruiting people to help to prepare. <coughs> so I was thinking that I will go to Nubrindavan to help prepare for Srila Prabhupada's arrival, then I will go back to Vrindavan, India. So I went to Nubrindavan, and there was great, great enthusiasm to prepare everything for Prabhupada's coming. There was a house called Madhuban, and it was an old, beaten-up house, and they wanted to renovate it. So I was helping with the painting and renovations. The day before Srila Prabhupada was coming, actually it was at night, he was coming the next morning, they discovered that the toilet didn't work. So everyone wanted to take rest and I was told to fix the toilet. I had never fixed a toilet in my life. I was just pushing things in the toilet. To, I don't know what I was doing, but I was just doing anything to try to get it to flush, because it wouldn't flush. Finally, I was up all night. Just when Srila Prabhupada was arriving, I pushed the lever and psh, it flushed. And I was thinking, Prabhupada's going to be so happy. He has a toilet that will flush. <laughs> <laughs> so then Srila Prabhupada came to the Madhuban house. And he went in, and I was just feeling so proud that I have made his toilet so it flushes. And when it was time for Srila Prabhupada to go to the toilet, the devotees led him and said, this is a very nice toilet. It works very nicely. And Prabhupada took his little lota and he went out into the field. And he responded to nature in the field. And then he took his bath in the field. And he said that, I enjoy responding to nature in the nice fresh breezes in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole time Srila Prabhupada was there, he went out to the field to respond to nature every time. He never used the toilet. So I got a lesson, Srila Prabhupada was teaching me a lesson of detachment. We should be willing to give anything and everything to please our Guru, but we cannot be attached to the results. He, there's a couple of incidents that I remember clearly. One was we he had a lecture at the University of San Diego, it's a Catholic school, and most of the persons attending were priests, nuns, bishops, car I think there was a cardinal there all the lay teachers of the um, Catholic Diocese of Southern California. There was a big crowd. My father also came. And we'd put Srila Prabhupada's Vyasa on top of a desk. 
and we'd put a chair, and he climbed up the chair onto the desk, onto his Vyasa sign. It was in a sort of a big, you know, lecture hall. And he's, he began his lecture by quoting a Sanskrit sloka that I've never been able to find. And then he said, this means you are what you eat. In this age, most people are eating hogs. I never forget, I was sitting on the floor at his feet, and I was, Prabhupada. How can you say this? I couldn't believe he would speak like this to this particular audience. You know, I could understand if he was calling the hippies drug addicts or whatever hogs, but he was calling this highly so-called cultured, religious, um, scholarly audience. He just said, you are all hogs. And I was just, I was totally dumbfounded. I looked at the faces of the other devotees. They were all dumbfounded, too. Because if I had been speaking to this audience, it was the last thing I would have said. But of course, Srila Prabhupada, with having no ahamkara you know, on the absolute platform, he could say anything and get away with it, whereas they probably would have come up and stoned me if I had said the same thing. I never forget that. I don't remember the rest of the lecture, and I've looked for it over and over again, and I, I've never been able to find it. I don't know, I don't think it's in the archives, or if it is, it hasn't been put in um, legible condition yet. Um, on another occasion during the same visit, we had been invited to uh, one Indian man's home and Srila Prabhupada went and we had some prasadam we ate there, I don't know if it was prasadam, but then Srila Prabhupada and this gentleman whose name was Dr. Duvari began a philosophical discussion. Dr. Duvari was presenting every variety of Western philosophy, atheist philosophy and so forth and Srila Prabhupada was countering him and the conversation began at 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the evening. And it went on and on and on. It was finally about 11.30 at night. And it's still going on. And it was just, there were three or four of us sitting there. We didn't say a word the whole time. We were just sitting, watching Srila Prabhupada and listening. And finally, Srila Prabhupada became exasperated with this man. And he just said, you're a fool. A mudha such as you I've never seen before. I've never met such a complete fool. And he started pounding him like this because the man wouldn't submit. And then finally, Dr. Duvari laid down and put his head on Srila Prabhupada's feet and he submitted. And since then, his entire family became Vaishnavs and they became, I was just in San Diego and their family and their family's family, they're still the biggest supporters of the San Diego temple. We, we drove Prabhupada to a, uh, a little function at an Indian's house with the people from the Indian community and devotees and and uh, we had a big kirtan when we got in and Prabhupada was sitting on the couch and chanting and I was playing Radanga and, and my son was there he was about uh, I guess how old was it three or four and he had a little wooden drum but he was kind of standing staring gawking at Prabhupada and Prabhupada went like this you know he moved his hands like this you know play the drum play the drum and so Rod started playing, Radha Gopinath started playing. And uh, we finished the kirtan, everybody stopped, and, and everybody thought Prabhupada would speak. But he looked over at Brahmananda and he said, you speak. And so Brahmananda was shocked. He was like, oh, you know, who wants to speak in front of the spiritual master? You know, it's just, it's just very unnerving. So he stood up and he stuttered and fumbled and said something, you know, philosophical. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, ha ha. It's a good thing I'm not a sannyasi, so Prabhupada can't get me, you know. Otherwise, I'd be in trouble or something, you know, because he'll probably ask all of the sannyasis to speak. So Brahmananda sat down, and I look over at Prabhupada. He looks over at me, and he goes, now you speak. <laughs> I almost froze to death. I, I just, I was in shock, and I just stood there. I sat there, and I went, oh, my God. He goes, stand up. So I stood up, and I, I, I was in some kind of vacuum. I don't know what it was, and I just spoke. And I hope it was transcendental. Nobody laughed, which might not have been so good because usually people laugh when I speak. But, <laughs> but anyway, that was very shocking. So later on, we were having prasadam, and I said, Prabhupada, do you mind if we chant bhajans while you eat? He said, no, not at all. I said, Prabhupada, do you have any favorite melodies for Hare Krishna? He said, oh, yes. I said, which one? He said, all of them. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada, every day was being brought on a palaquin to the top of a mountain where there was a beautiful um, pavilion that was made just for Srila Prabhupada's discourses. 
devotees worked very hard to make it for Prabhupada. And there was a wonderful stage and wonderful Vyasa song. And hundreds of devotees and guests came from all over America for this Bhagavad Dharma discourse. The first day he was brought up on a palaquin. The devotees spent weeks making this palaquin for Prabhupada. When it was time for him to get up, they couldn't find the palaquin. <laughs> Finally, Prabhupada was just waiting and waiting and waiting. And then they found the palaquin and they brought him up. And afterward, Prabhupada devotees worked so hard and they had a whole procession of kirtan up this mountain and it was so uncomfortable for him. So when he got to the top, he, he said, isn't there a car that can drive me up here? <laughs> so every day after that, they would drive him up by, uh, Hari Griva would drive him with a Volkswagen. We're driving home and uh, one of the cars pulled up beside us with one devotee, a Yojapati, who was the cook. And I said, Prabhupada, this is our cook. And I said, every day, every morning, we have rice, dal, chapatis, and really nice sabji, basmati rice. I described the whole, you know, uh, dinner to him. And I said, we eat once, one main meal a day, and then just in the evening, you know, we have a little snack, because that's the most practical. He said, that's perfect, because Prabhupada had said that. One main meal a day, either in the morning or in the afternoon or evening. We chose the morning. So later on, when we went the next day to Montreal, and uh, we were sitting in the airport waiting for Prabhupada's plane, one of the devotees, in fact, it was Shivaram, he said, Prabhupada, is there any ideal diet for Sankirtan devotees? Prabhupada said, oh, yes. He said, well, what is it? And he looked at me, he said, you tell them. So I described to him what our prasadam program was, and he said, this is ideal. And uh, prior to that, we were in the garden, because Prabhupada couldn't stay overnight, so he was just hanging out with the devotees. And he said, let's read from the Gita. So he had Jagadish read from the Gita some verses from chapter 8, I think, about leaving your body, quitting your body at a certain time. And so Jagadish read some verses, and he said, well, speak, say something. I thought, here we go again. And so Jagadish spoke, and he said, now you read and you speak. And he gave me the book, and he made me read and speak again. So I had a chance to speak in front of Prabhupada again. And uh, um, after that, then Prabhupada left. So just as a kind of an epilogue to this, when the next festival came up, this was summer of 75 and 76, I believe it was, yeah. Um, we were at the festival and it took a few days for all the devotees to gather together. And then Prabhupada made his grand entrance from the second floor to the whole crowd because everybody was, was there. And chanting and kirtan going on and everybody looking at Prabhupada, waiting for some little small glance or, you know, some acknowledgement, anything, you know, just, just anything, even just in their direction. And Prabhupada was walking through the devotees down the stairs, down the stairs, and down the pathway. And I was way down the end of the pathway, right at the walkway. And Prabhupada was walking down and he looked at me and he smiled. And he kept looking at me, and he kept smiling, and then he walked right over to me, and he stopped. Everybody was shocked, and he, and he said, so, everything's going all right in, in Toronto and Chicago? I said, yes, Prabhupada, everything's going wonderful. Good, that's good. And then he looked at Amarendra, and he said, and is everything going good in Detroit? He said, oh, Prabhupada, I'm Amarendra, I'm not Govardhan. He goes, oh, okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> in um, 1970, this was during the preparations for the Rathyatra, and I was working in Berkeley. Devotees were working in Berkeley cutting fruit for f huge fruit salad. And early morning, we didn't get much sleep, but maybe an hour, hour and a half. We got up in the morning, we were doing a small morning program. And we were sitting in the temple room reciting the Guru Vastok prayers in English. And suddenly Srila Prabhupada came in the room. Nobody, we had no idea that he was coming. It was spontaneous. He arrived at the temple and he sat down on his Vyasasan. And he just said, continue doing what you're doing. So we're reciting, and we recited, uh, the spiritual master is very satisfied when he sees the devotees eating Bhagwat Prashadam. And Sri Prabhupada would leave. He said, yes, this is the best part. <laughs> we die, Prabhupada. <clears throat> and then there was John Mastami. And I remember John Mastami night, Radha Vrindavan Chandra was being moved into a new temple in which the devotees had just built. And 
there was about a month's worth of work to be done that day. As often devotees' time schedules create. So <clears throat> the devotees were working frantically because at a certain hour Prabhupada was going to come to see the deities, Radha Vrindavan Chandra, in their new temple. So just as Prabhupada was walking in, one door, ladders and buckets were running out the Pujayaram door. And when Prabhupada came, everything was perfect, everything was complete. But the walls had just been painted. We were all praying that Prabhupada wouldn't touch the walls. <laughs> so he came in and he saw the beauty of Radha Vrindavan Chandra. And he was looking at them. And he actually had tears in his eyes as he was just glancing upon the beauty of Radha Vrindavan Chandra. And the wonderful worship that the devotees were offering. And Srila Prabhupada spoke to us. And he said that your Radha Vrindavan Chandra are most beautiful. They have appeared before you just like the most beautiful American boy and girl, just to attract your hearts. And then he said, your worship is very beautiful. He said, but be very careful. There are two paths in, on the path of bhakti. There is Pancharatraki Vidhi and there is Bhagavad Dharma. Pancharatraki Vidhi means worshipping the deity with great devotion and performing all services for the pleasure of the deity. And Bhagavad Dharma means hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. He said they are like two rails on the same train track. They must go together. He said if you are not attentively hearing Srimad Bhagavatam and chanting the holy names every day, he said, the day will come when you look at Radha Vrindavan Chandra and you will think, why has my Guru Maharaj left me with this burden? His words seared into our hearts. And I remember from that day on, the sadhana of the devotees at New Vrindavan was so incredibly strict. So strict. The devotees were getting up at two in the morning to chant their rounds. Everyone was there for Srimad Bhagavatam class. Prabhupada inspired that. Bon Maharaj, Prabhupada's godbrother, came to America, sponsored by uh, Professor McDonnell, or McDonnell, I think McDonnell, John McDonnell, or something like that. He was a real nice professor, PhD in, uh, in, I guess, South Asian studies. He had gone to Mayapur and done his dissertation on Chaitanya Vaishnavism for his PhD and taught at the, uh, you know, the uh, Department of Religions in Toronto. He was very favorably disposed to us, and I became friends with him. And he sponsored Bon Maharaj coming over. And uh, so we met Bon Maharaj at his house. We invited him to the temple. He came for a kirtan. He gave a lecture and spoke, you know, with a certain degree of erudition and pretty articulate. And then we went, uh, Professor McDonnell arranged for a uh, meeting with what was known as an ecumenical council in Toronto, which was a collection of heads, uh, certain leaders of, of different religious groups, the Jewish community, the Baptists, the Christians, the Catholics, the, you know, the Seventh-day Adventists, and on and on. And he came and he had written a, a, a translation and commentary on Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the Nectar of Devotion. And so uh, he gave a little talk. And it was very elevated. It was about, you know, Radha and Krishna and Radharani being the, uh, you know, the pleasure potency of Krishna. But he spoke in a language similar to Bhakti Siddhanta that wasn't really everyday language. And if you really didn't know the basic principles, you wouldn't really get it. And I could see that they were just paying polite attention but they weren't getting anything. So after he spoke, each one of them took a turn to uh, say something. Well, we're really glad to have you, and we think in this, and religious unity, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, just saying all this useless things, you know, just kind of trying to be nice. But they all went around the room, and then it came to me. And they didn't, I could see they didn't really want me to speak, but, of course, that was their problem, you know. So I said, well, you know, it's interesting to me to, we, we're gathered here today, uh, representatives of different spiritual groups in, in the community. 
and we've heard you know Bon Maharaj in it from India speak about God but yet I don't hear anybody else speaking about God. If that's the thing that we all have in common, why is it that we can't talk about that and explore one another's realizations or concepts or understandings of what God is or who God is or, you know, like that? Because certainly we have that in common and it seems rather strange that we're not doing that and we're just sort of saying very, you know, light things that don't really mean anything, you know? I can't even remember what I said, but I know I agitated everybody. <laughs> and so they all sort of took a turn shooting me down and speaking without looking at me and talking about fanaticism and this and that and the other thing. <laughs> so I guess I did something right because I really aggravated them and uh, put them on the spot. So what happened was, in Toronto, when Prabhupada looked at the building, one of the other things that he talked to me about was he heard about this. And there were some morning walks that I heard about that he asked questions because people told him what I did. And so he, he talked to me. He said, well, what did Bon Maharaj say? So I told him to the best of my remembrance. And one of the things that Bon Maharaj said after I spoke was something to the effect that Lord Chaitanya never really preached. He just kind of chanted and, you know, loved God and, you know, didn't really preach any philosophy. And I, I can't remember exactly, but something to that effect. And, and I said, well, geez, you know, that's not the way I understood it. You know, that's not what my spiritual master said. But I didn't want to get too uppity in front of Prabhupada's god brother out of respect. But I told Prabhupada that. And then Prabhupada started saying all sorts of things to, to shoot down his, his, uh, the things that he had said. He said, no, Lord Chaitanya never said that. He did this, he did that. And I can't remember the details. But he gave so many references to Chaitanya Charitamrita where Lord Chaitanya did preach and did, you know, get very specific about philosophy and who Krishna was and how we should understand all of that and how that fits into our devotional realization and progress. So that was a nice, you know, exchange with Prabhupada talking to him about Bone Maharaj and he was very happy that I had said that and sort of challenged and created a disturbance like that. He thought that was cool. So And after the Kirtan and the I believe after the Arti, Srila Prabhupada told the devotees to read Krishna book. It was a small temple and it was completely overcrowded with devotees. And I remember the deities were in the front, Prabhupada was in the back of the temple and there was an aisleway between that was left open. And along the two sides of the aisle were the sannyasis. All the sannyasis of North America were there sitting facing each other with their dandas in their hands. And behind them was just devotees crowded so tight. And the sannyasis started to read. <clears throat> By this time it was very late at night and it was very hot and you could hardly breathe in that temple. And Srila Prabhupada was sitting on his Vyasasan with his back erect, listening attentively to Krishna's Leela. And everyone in the temple room was so exhausted we were falling asleep. Literally people were falling down and being caught by each other. And I'll never forget the sight, because I was new with Iniskan at this time, that the sannyasis were all sitting and they all kept falling asleep. And they were holding the dundas, and you would just see their dundas going like this. Dundas were going like this and up. And it, nobody could stay awake in the whole temple room. But Prabhupada was sitting with his back straight, attentively hearing the glories of Lord Krishna. And when the first chapter was ended, the devotee read, thus ends the first chapter of Krishna book entitled, I think, The Advent of Lord Krishna. And everyone, when they heard that the chapter ended, they were so happy, they chanted, Jai Srila Prabhupada! Not because of the book, but because it was over. <laughs> and Srila Prabhupada sat with complete gravity and said, next chapter. And then they started reading the next chapter. And the devotees, the sannyasis were falling asleep. The devotees, everyone was just struggling and straining. Plus, we fasted all day. Besides being tired, we were very hungry. It was way after midnight by this time. And the second chapter, I think it's the prayers of the, demigod, of the demigods in the womb. It was a long, long chapter. And it seemed like hours and hours. And then 
the devotee read, thus ends the second chapter of Krishna book entitled, The Prayers by the Demigods to Krishna in the Womb. And everyone was so happy that it was over, thinking in terms of prasad and sleep. They chanted, Jai Prabhupada! Jai Prabhupada was sitting. Next chapter. He started reading the next chapter. And when I was watching him, I was thinking of Maharaj Parikshit. How Maharaj Parikshit was sitting for seven days and seven nights, rapt attention, just hearing the glories of the Lord, tasting the sweetness of the ambrosia. And it says in Srimad Bhagavatam that this is really the sign of a great soul, as he has such a taste to hear Krishna's glories. And I was watching all of us. We were struggling and straining, falling asleep, falling down, praying that the reading would end. And Prabhupada was sitting there, completely in, immersed in the ecstasy of hearing Krishna's Leela. And then the next chapter ended, and by that time the devotees hardly were able to even say, Jai Prabhupada. <laughs> <laughs> and then Srila Prabhupada looked at all of us. We were pathetic. And he just smiled. He was still sitting erect, completely immersed in Krishna's Leela. And he said to us, that I think that you are all very tired and hungry, so we will end here. <laughs> and then everybody, as loud as you could imagine, chanted, Jai Prabhupada! <laughs> and Srila Prabhupada was very happy just to see all of us together at Nubin and Dhaban. This is in 1972, just uh, at the time Srila Prabhupada came to the San Diego Temple, there was, this, there was one devotee in San Francisco I think his name was Devarshi, and he'd become a little bit famous as a very expert seller of Back to Godhead magazines. But somehow or other, he had had a minor fall down, I think a sexual uh, liaison of some sort, and the temple president in San Francisco had kicked him out because out of the temple because of this, and he was sort of lost. And he was wandering around, and the San Francisco Temple President was calling on, don't let this Devarshi in, he's a rogue, he had sex. And he called me, and, but then Devarshi shows up in the front door of the San Diego Temple. And I had a hard time keeping anyone out. Srila Prabhupada was there, and Devarshi's sitting on the front lawn, wanting to come in. I said, why don't you come see Srila Prabhupada? He came in, and... He explained something to Srila Prabhupada about what had happened and how he wasn't welcome in the temples anymore. Nobody liked him. Prabhupada said, you come and travel with me. <laughs> so this is the example of his compassion. Nobody else wanted him, then come and travel with me. I want you. He didn't reject anyone. You came to New Vrindavan, and I was given charge of garlanding Prabhupada, which was a very special service. When Srila Prabhupada first arrived, <coughs> the plan was he was going to be escorted into the temple, and then when he sits on his Vyasasan, I was to greet him by putting the garland around his neck. <coughs> <coughs> so because of that, I got to be right there when Prabhupada came out of his car. It was a Lincoln Continental, and I had a tray with Prabhupada's garland on it. And everybody was pushing to be with Prabhupada. But because I had his garland, I was allowed to walk right behind him, immediately almost to the side and behind him. So I walked into the temple and Srila Prabhupada bowed down before Radha Chandra. And with great, great emotion, he, he just stared at the deities for about a minute or two. And then he went by back and sat on the Vyasasan. And by that time, all the devotees were crowded in the temple room, and the kirtan was going on. And I had the garland, and I approached Srila Prabhupada. And Srila Prabhupada looked at me, and he smiled. And then he bent his head down for me to put the garland on him. But I felt so shy that I didn't put the garland on him. So Prabhupada was looking at me like this, like, put it. And I was just standing there. <laughs> 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 and Prabhupada was saying, 
he didn't say anything, but with his eyes, he says so many things. So one of my sannyasi god brothers was standing next to me. At that time, I was a brahmachari. So I gave the garland to this god brother of mine, and the god brother put the garland on Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada didn't even look at my god brother. He was just looking at me, and he was so pleased. He, he nodded his head like, yes, this is correct. You have understood. He didn't say anything. But through his gesture and through his eyes, he spoke in such a way that I could understand. He was saying, yes, to be the servant of my servant is the best way to please me. And that was one of the most wonderful instructions Srila Prabhupada ever gave me. And I'm, with my life and soul, endeavoring to try to follow that instruction. So we were in Toronto the next year. Prabhupada came back again. We had the building this time. So he came back to the new temple. And uh, I was president of Chicago, and Madhavananda had taken over from Govardhan in Detroit. And at one point, Prabhupada said uh, something, there was some discussion about Detroit, and the Indian community wasn't happy or whatever. And he said, Well, you know, what can't Govardhan? Oh, well, Govardhan isn't president anymore. Prabhupada, who is? Oh, uh, you know, Madhavananda's president. Well, why is he president? Well, Govardhan was having trouble. He wasn't chanting his rounds. Well, how do you know he wasn't chanting his rounds? Well, Prabhupada, he said he wasn't. Well, at least he's honest enough to admit it. You say you are. How do I know you are? Maybe you're lying. At least he's... He, but Prabhupada, he wasn't coming to the morning program. Well, you have to encourage him. Put him back as president. He did so much good work there. You know, he should be temple president. So, Govardhan got reinstated as temple president. Well, this, of course, uh, Sri Govinda, I had taken over from him, and he was absolutely livid that he got replaced as temple president. Um, it was absolutely justifiable, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we won't get into that. But, and, and ironically, I had taken over Montreal from Sri Pati, and I took over Chicago from Sri Govinda. And when I was there, it was such a disaster, I said to Jagadish, you've got to send me somebody to help me out. I need a couple of right-hand soldiers. So he said, all right, I'll send some people to help you. He sent Sri Pati and Sri Govinda. <laughs> I said, oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> so somehow or another, I managed to, uh, you know, to use uh, an appropriate amount of diplomacy. Sri Pati was fine. We were best of friends. But Sri Govinda, it was very difficult for him to accept me. Uh, but it was very easy for everybody else to not accept him. <laughs> so uh, he wrote this big thing. I don't know. I heard it was 10 pages or 20 pages of why he should be temple president of Chicago and I shouldn't. And he tried, like, everything to meet Prabhupada here and there to present it to him in hopes that, like Govardhan, he would be reinstated. So finally, and I guess it was in New York I heard that he got a chance to go to Prabhupada and say, Prabhupada, I've written this thing, I want you to read it, I should be president of Chicago, and I, I think it's a good thing. And Prabhupada said, oh, change is good, sometimes change is good. Let's leave things the way they are. <laughs> I remember one of my god brothers, I believe it was Adoitacharya, he was asking Prabhupada about Siddha Deha. And in the middle of the sentence, as soon as he said the word Siddha Deha, Prabhupada cut him off. He said, what is this nonsense talking Siddha Deha? You are filled with so many bad qualities. He said, don't talk about Siddha Deha. And he explained, first you purify yourself through chanting Harinam. First you purify yourself by following the regulative principles. First, you purify yourself by practicing the basic principles of Krishna consciousness. Until you're purified, don't talk about Siddha Deha. He was very strong, like a lion. Another devotee was talking about what if after taking initiation you fall down. Srila Prabhupada again like a lion. He said, what is this fall down? There is no question of fall down. You have taken a vow in front of your spiritual master in front of the deities, in front of the sacred fire, in front of the assembly of Vaishnavas. You have made your promise. How can you break your promise? No gentleman will break such a promise. There is no question of falling down. Another devotee named Janardhan, he asked Srila Prabhupada that sometimes people say, that 
I don't need a guru because Krishna speaks to me within my heart. God speaks to me within the heart. What do we say to such a person? Prabhupada became very grave and very, very much heavy. He said, you don't know how to answer this question? You don't read my books? Why don't, why you rascal, why you cannot answer this question? And he started chastising Janardhan severely. And then he explained the answer that Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Tesham satata yuktanam bhajatam priti puravakam dadami buddhiyogantam yena mamupagantate that only one who worships Krishna with complete devotion and does not fall down in any circumstance, only to such a person does Krishna speak within, constantly serving me with love. He said, why, you tell, why don't you answer this? Why you don't know this verse? And he just went on and on and on chastising Janardhan. And he was so heavy that everybody was like paralyzed. They just couldn't cope with Prabhupada's anger. And one devotee named Kula Shekhar, he asked Prabhupada a simple question to try to change the subject. And after he asked the question, Prabhupada just went back to Janardhan and continued to chastise him. He said, you are a rascal. He said, you, are, you have simply come to give me disturbance. <laughs> In this way, Srila Prabhupada really seriously stressed to all of us how we should learn his books and be able to preach according to his books, that he had given so much of his life and his energy to write these books for us, that we should, he speaks through his books. We don't have to ask him all these things personally. That was the lesson that I believe he was trying to teach us. <laughs> on that day. Of course, during that time, we would walk with Srila Prabhupada not often because there was a number of devotees wanting to walk with him, but once every 10 days or once every two weeks, you'd get to go in the morning walk. And I don't have great recollection of the conversations. I remember that at one time he was indicating that the day will come when we will, when the Krishna Consciousness Movement will be so powerful that if someone doesn't chant, we will shoot them. <laughs> Sometimes people um, don't like it when I t say that story, but I remember it very, very distinctly that Srila Prabhupada was fully confident that Krishna Consciousness would be established as the Dharma of the age and that it would spread throughout the whole world, would become the, the universal religion and it was simply a matter of time. Of course, he never indicated how much time that would be. We always, have, you know, the Christians have been saying Jesus is going to come again every year for the last 2,000 years, so I think we're also thinking that, you know, in the next 10 years the world's going to end and by magic Krishna consciousness is going to spread. Whether that's true or not, we don't know, but we, we can be confident and assured that this is the Yuga Dharma and it will spread and we should take part in it. I remember Prabhupada saying once, I think Satsvarup asked him, how can we accelerate our advancement in Krishna consciousness? Morning walk in Mayapur. Prabhupada said, if, just think that I'm going to die in one minute. If you knew you were going to die in a minute, how accelerated would, you, would your consciousness be focused on Krishna? So if you, if you think like that, I could die in a minute. That, that kind of mindset will give you the kind of uh, intensity of focus that you need. Every day, I lived in the old Brindavan farm, which was on the other side of the mountain. And I had to go all the way, to, every evening to see Srila Prabhupada, I had to climb down, because I was Pujari, I had to climb down a mountain, across a small river, and then climb up a mountain, and then come to Prabhupada. Every day, as I was climbing up, there was a rose bush. And one beautiful, fully blossomed rose would be there every day. It was like a miracle. And I would pick that rose and I would always bring it. And when I would come, when Srila Prabhupada would sit on his Vyasa sound, I would offer that rose at his lotus feet. And oftentimes, when he would be lecturing, he would pick up that rose and just hold it in his hand. And I remember one day, he was holding that rose I offered him, and he was smelling it, and he was looking at it, and he gave an example. 
He said, just like this rose is a flower. He had a garland of marigolds. He said, these are also flowers. He says, but still, this is a rose. Although they are both flowers, still the rose is the best of flowers. And he said, similarly, we are all simultaneously one and different than Krishna. Although we are one with Krishna, still Krishna is Krishna. Krishna is the rose. He gives this example of a chintya beta beta shakt, chintya beta beta tattva. We had organized a uh, festival in Balboa Park in the Starlight Opera Theater. I think it was on July 1st, 1970. We tried to advertise and promote it, but unfortunately not a lot of people came. But still there was a, there was a reasonable crowd. And Srila Prabhupada was sitting on the stage on his Vyasa sign, and he started to lecture about Lord Chaitanya. And as his lecture began, some drunk hippie in the audience started screaming, We want sex! We love sex! 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 We want sex! And Srila Prabhupada leaned over and said, What is he saying? I, I said, Srila Prabhupada, he says he wants sex. <laughs> so Srila Prabhupada stopped his lecture and he changed and he spoke about sex and the real purpose of sex and spiritual sex and so forth. And that was quite amazing. That lecture is recorded, it is in the archives, and you can, you can hear that. One time I asked him, I said, Prabhupada, if somebody's having trouble, you know, with sex desire or whatever, what should you do? He said, chant Hare Krishna more. You know, that's all. Another time, I remember during those evening darshans, I was feeling a little guilty because I had lost my counting beads. And I was chanting my 16 rounds. And in Uvrindavan in those days, it was not easy to get counting beads or anything. So I was chanting my 16 rounds. But on that particular day, the only day I can ever remember in my life at that point, that I wasn't sure whether I finished my rounds or not. So as I was sitting just a few feet from Srila Prabhupada's Vyasasan, the thought came to my mind that I'm not sure whether I finished my rounds today. Just when I thought that, Srila Prabhupada looked right at me. He just stared at me very sincerely. Because during the darshan, when he wasn't talking to people, he'd be chanting japa. He looked at me and he held up his bead bag and he took one of his counting beads and very meticulously and slowly and deliberately he pulled it down like this and then went like and he was looking at me right at that time and I was thinking Srila Prabhupada wants me to get counting beads. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada wants to make absolutely sure that there can be no compromise, that we, that we properly chant our 16 rounds every day. I remember Prabhupada saying in L.A. when I was, before I was initiated, he was talking, he was referring to the verse in the Gita, Rasoham Mapsukhonteya, I am the taste in water. And he said, you know, even a, 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 a wino or a drunk man, if he drinks his wine and he thinks that Krishna is the taste in that, you know, he can make some advancement by by that consciousness. That consciousness will be purifying to him. Not the drinking of the wine, of course, but if he has that consciousness, that will be something uh, progressive and he can, you know, he should think like that even. One evening, devotees assembled for the night darshan and it was very cold and it was raining that night. And Srila Prabhupada's secretary, who was then pushed to Krishna Maharaj, he came out and he told us that Srila Prabhupada will not be giving darshan tonight. <clears throat> we were all gathered at the front door of the house. And we were very sad that we wouldn't be able to have Srila Prabhupada's most precious association that night. So we all started walking away. And somehow Prabhupada, through another window in the house, saw how despondent we were when we were walking away. So he told Pushta Krishna that call them in, because usually he was outside. So he called us and said, Srila Prabhupada wants you to come in, he'll give you darshan. So we all came into this living room, we were all crowded in, 
and we were sitting down and then Srila Prabhupada came out and he was very, very ill that night. He just sat with his hand in his head like this and he asked Prajumana to read from Srimad Bhagavatam, 12th canto, about the symptoms of Kali Yuga. And it was announced that he would not speak that night. We would just be able to sit with him and hear Srimad Bhagavatam. So Pradyumna started to read some of the symptoms of Kali Yuga. And Prabhupada was sitting. And I remember he became so enlivened to hear Vedavyasa's descriptions of what will come in Kali Yuga that every time he read a symptom, Srila Prabhupada, he just all of a sudden became free of all of his sickness and dynamic and full of joy. He began to explain. Like I remember he said, people will, people who are living, people will travel long, long places just to go to a place of pilgrimage. This is a symptom of Kali. And Prabhupada said, yes, just like today. People are living in Calcutta and they are on the bank of the Ganges and they will go through so much trouble to go all the way to Hardwar just to bathe in the Ganges. He said, similarly, you are in New Vrindavan. New Vrindavan is non different than Vrindavan. He said, you have no need to go anywhere. Vrindavan is here and Krishna is here. And all of the devotees became very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and then they read the, Prajumana read about how a symptom of Kali will be beauty will be seen by how long one grows his hair. And Prabhupada said, yes, you see, Veda Vyas, he could see past, present, and future. He said, at the time when he wrote this Srimad Bhagavatam, there was no hippie movement, but he knew the hippie movement would come. <laughs> and then he began to explain how Srimad Bhagavatam was the perfect scripture, because it was written by Veda Vyas, who had perfect realization and who had perfect vision of past, present, and future, and perfect vision of Krishna. So in this way, what, what originally appeared to be a very despondent night of just going away without Prabhupada became the most wonderful of all the darshans. There was an, a nice incident. The next day, um, Mr. Joshi, who was a Punjabi magistrate, retired, lived in uh, the Berkeley area, across the San Francisco Bay, had invited Srila Prabhupada to come for lunch. It was a, sort of a traditional thing. Every time Srila Prabhupada came to San Francisco, he would go to Mr. Joshi's for lunch. Mr. Joshi would greet him with a garland of $1 bills. We'd all criticize Mr. Joshi, why you're not giving $100 bills? <laughs> and Mr. Joshi would wash Prabhupada's feet, he'd wash all the devotees' feet, and he'd sit us down. Um, but at the time, my body was feeling wiped out. I'd been working hard for this Ratha Yatra for a number of weeks, and it seemed like after every festival the body would collapse. And I remember sitting down for prasadam, and I just felt horrible. And, but I hadn't said anything to anyone. I just was determined I'm just going to grit it out, you know. And, but Srila Prabhupada looked at me, and he said, Bhaktadas, you're not feeling well? I said, Srila Prabhupada, I'm a little bit sick. And he said, you go take rest. You have worked hard. Now, take rest. Yes, Srila Prabhupada. I paid my obeisances and I walked into a bedroom in the back and laid down and passed out. And after some time I heard some noise and I look up, Srila Prabhupada was coming in. And so I jump out of the bed and fall down at his feet and pay my dandavats and I start to walk out of the room and Prabhupada point, he says, take rest, you've worked hard, take rest. <laughs> yes, Srila Prabhupada, so I got back in the bed and there was two twin beds right next to each other, and I was in the one on the right, and Mr. Joshi came and he pulled back the covers of the other bed, and Srila Prabhupada crawled in, and then Mr. Joshi tucked Srila Prabhupada in like he was a small child. It was very sweet, and so, I mean, the two beds were maybe an 18 inches apart or less, and my head was here, and Prabhupada's head was there, and we took a nap. <laughs> And of course, for me, it wasn't an ordinary nap. It was a uh, Goloka nap, Yoga Nidra nap, very extraordinary. But I think it can show us how much compassion, how much sensitive, how much caring Srila Prabhupada was 
for the devotees and how he didn't carry an air that, hey, I'm the guru and you're a nobody, you go get out there on the floor and I'm taking the bed. He treat, I mean, he was actually equal to everyone. Um, of course, we did. I saw him, he's God to me, but um, the kindness is what overwhel was overwhelming. And always when I think of Srila Prabhupada, you know, every time he ever saw me, he, the first thing he would say is, Bhakti Das, are you happy? He's always concerned, are you happy? And of course, I was always happy when I was with Srila Prabhupada. Sometimes before I went to see him, I was, ah! <laughs> but always when you'd see him, everything disappeared. All problems evaporated. There weren't any problems in his presence. Toward the beginning of his visit, the weather became quite cold and rainy. And Srila Prabhupada decided he should leave New Vrindavan because it wasn't very suitable to his health. So his secretary told that Srila Prabhupada's going to be cutting his trip here short because the weather here does not agree with him. <coughs> At that time, Kirtananda Swami became very sad and he told Srila Prabhupada that that if this place is not suitable for you to live happily, then we will just leave this place and sell it and start New Vrindavan somewhere else. And I'll never forget Srila Prabhupada's reply. He said, no. He said, because you are protecting Krishna's cows here, your mission is perfect. It is a success. And then he said, I will stay until the end of my scheduled visit. I guarded Prabhupada's room in, in Portland, Oregon. He was there for a few days. And I asked his servant, you know, what do you do with Prabhupada's bead bags? He goes, well, I give them away. I said, well, can I have one? And he said, sure. And he sent me one in Montreal. And I still have that bead bag, and I kept the beads that Prabhupada chanted on at my initiation. They're in there, and they're on my little Prabhupada altar. But during that Portland stay, we went to some kind of a New Age meeting where Prabhupada spoke. And uh, when he was speaking, some, uh, there was a lady in the audience who had a little child, and the child was crying. And Prabhupada said, could you please take the child out? And the lady said, oh, is the child disturbing you? Prabhupada said, no, the child's not disturbing me, it's disturbing you and everyone else. One night when it was cold and raining, he was having a small darshan in his, in his own little private bedroom, or recording room where he would do his translations and only about 15 devotees could fit. Now I had a picture, I, I was the pujari of the brahmachari's temple, it was Radha Vrindavanath's temple and Srila Prabhupada was very merciful to me. I used to make sandesh every day and Srila Prabhupada whenever anyone from New Vrindavan would go to visit Prabhupada, they would always bring him a box of sandesh I made. And he, out of his great kindness, he always showed appreciation. And when he came to New Vrindavan, he told me that he wanted me to make sandesh for him for every meal, three times a day. So on this one particular night, I came with a picture of the deities from the Brahmachari Ashram, Radha Vrindavanath because Kirtananda Swami decided that Srila Prabhupada should not go there because the road was too treacherous and because the ashram was so primitive and, and there was no modern anything there. He thought it, was, it would be an inconvenience for Prabhupada. So I was thinking as Pujari, if he's not going to come to see the deities, at least the deities could come to see him. So I came with a photo and Pushta Krishna was not allowing anyone in his room, but I said, I have a gift for Prabhupada. So he said, all right, you come in. So I came in and I offered this picture of Radha Vrindavanath, the only photo we had of those deities. <coughs> and Prabhupada looked at it, and he was so happy. As he looked at it, he asked Kirtananda Swami, is this Radha Vrindavan Chandra? He said, no, this is Radha Vrindavanath, and this is the boy who always makes sandesh for you. And <laughs> And Srila Prabhupada was looking at the picture and he began to just talk about Vrindavan. And then he said, you will take me there? 
And Kirtananda Swami said, no, Prabhupada, the road is very bad. It is, it is very difficult to get up there. And Prabhupada said, you have pickup, jeep, we will go. I want to go. So Prabhupada intervened with all the cancellations of his trip there, and he insisted that he go. So they took him by a jeep part of the way, and then the rest of the way would be his morning walk. As he was walking, there were cows in the pasture, and the original cow of Iskan, her name was Kalia. She was a very small black jersey. At that time, she was very old. When she saw Srila Prabhupada, she ran to him. This is the first cow of our movement, and Prabhupada personally named her Kalia. Eight years later, he had never seen her since 1968 when he first came to New Vrindavan. When the cow came running up, one devotee said, one devotee said, Prabhupada, this is a very special cow. And Prabhupada said, yes, I know, this is Kalia. And Kalia walked beside Prabhupada for the morning walk. I wanted to bring Jayananda to see. All the devotees of San Francisco wanted to have a darshan of Srila Paul, but most of them had never seen him, and they'd worked so hard. So I gathered most of the local devotees and brought them to Srila Prabhupada's room, and I wanted to bring Jayananda. Jayananda kept saying, I know I'm too busy, I don't have time, I have to work. And I grabbed him, I said, you're coming, you're going to go see your spiritual master, and I threw him in the car, <laughs> drove him over. And Prabhupada was staying in an apartment, Keshvabharti's apartment, and we all went in together and paid our obeisances. And Jayananda sat down against the far back wall, and he went to sleep instantly. Within moments, he was asleep, and he didn't say a word to Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada didn't say a word to him. We had our darshan for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. We got up to leave, and I said, Jayananda, it's time to go. Okay, paid his obeisances, and he walked out. And I believe that was the last time Srila Prabhupada ever, or Jayananda ever, um, no, I guess he saw him again in 75. But I, you know, it was obvious that the relationship between Srila Prabhupada and Jayananda extended far, far beyond the range of the voice or this body, that it wasn't at all dependent upon that, um, those conditions. It was in New York, and Prabhupada was on a morning walk. And as they were walking along, Prabhupada stopped and looked up at some birds that were singing in the tree. And he said, uh, oh, they're chanting Hare Krishna. And the devotees looked at each other, stunned, thinking, wow, Prabhupada understands the language of the birds. And they said, Prabhupada, are they really chanting Hare Krishna? And he said, sounds like it to me. <laughs> Prabhupada was so encouraging. He was so encouraging. He would do anything to try to increase a devotee's enthusiasm for devotional service. One time when he was eating the sandesh I prepared for him, he said that this is the best sandesh I have ever tasted in my entire life. And <coughs> somebody from some other place brought him sandesh another occasion, and he ate it. And the, and the person who brought it said, do you like this sandesh? He said, it is very good, but it is not as good as rata nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so in this way, he would say, he would say whatever it took to enliven us and invoke a desire to serve him and serve Krishna. Another time, one devotee named Taru made sweet rice. And Prabhupada tasted the sweet rice at New Vrindavan, and he said that I have not tasted sweet rice so good in 40 years. <laughs> Another time, Chandramali Swami, he made pera for Srila Prabhupada, and Prabhupada liked it so much. He said he has not tasted pera like this for so many years. He said, please give this to me with all my meals. Another um, letter that wasn't to me, but that he wrote to uh, Ramaswar um, at the end of one Christmas marathon, Ramaswar had written and given him these scores, which were quite enormous. I think it was in 73 or 74. 
And Srila Prabhupada wrote that it's very nice, you've sold so many books, congratulations, I'm very pleased. But the final sentence he said, but the highest realization is to save yourself. And when I read that, it was like a sledgehammer in my heart because we're walking, I mean, at least we're probably, most of us are walking around thinking we're saved and we're saving others. But why is he telling us the highest thing is to save yourself? I, I felt that we'd become like the Christians thinking, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus and these people are all heathens and we're going to save them. We become puffed up very easily and intoxicated by ourselves. So, you know, that letter, those words have always stayed with me. And when Srila Prabhupada would give cookies to the children during Guru Puja, it was a wonderful thing because I was thinking that this is, this is a real preacher. The children couldn't understand philosophy. They weren't able to follow the Srimad Bhagavatam class. But Srila Prabhupada knew if they just became attached to him, they would go back to Godhead. So with a beautiful, loving smile, like a father, he would give each child a cookie, and the children just, just loved Prabhupada. Everything he did was to induce our love for him, because he knew that our love for him was being carried to the lotus feet of Radha and Krishna. Regarding the question of the origin of the jiva soul, Srila Prabhupada was constantly being asked uh, where did we come from? Were we originally with Krishna and so forth? And I was with him several times when this question came up and invariably he gave the same answer, at least when I was present, and it was that you're, you're sick, you have a disease. Do you care how you got the disease or do you care about getting better? So first get better, then you'll understand. That was his point. He made that point over and over and over again. Now there's so much discussion and people are studying different scriptures trying to say, well, we were originally with Krishna or we came from the Brahma Jyoti, we've never been with Krishna. Um, what is the point of speculating about it? Why not get healthy? The to me, the discussion is, uh, is, is a waste of time. And that's how Srila Prabhupada always dealt with it with us. Just get yourself healthy. Not think we're such big scholars that by studying books we're going to understand. It's not something we can understand by studying books. We've got to understand it by having it revealed to us by pure devotional service. It was the 1977 Mayapur festival and uh, at that time Prabhupada was was sick to the point where he wasn't speaking, wasn't participating in any functions, wasn't giving class and everybody was very disturbed because we didn't know what to make of all this. At any point, they had a uh, kirtan contest uh, between all the temples. And at that time, I was the president of Chicago, and we were really into kirtan. In fact, I had imbibed the Bengali style, and I was introducing it in Chicago, and later on it became popular all over the movement. And we chanted at a uh, preliminary round, you know, I guess, and uh, we won that round, and we were going to go on to the finals. It was just whittled down to a few groups. But at the same time, unfortunately, there was a little bit of controversy, a little bit of antagonism towards our group. Because we were so much into kirtan, people took it the wrong way and started criticizing us. And I told the men in my group to just ignore it because that wasn't the mood that we were in and we didn't have to put up with that. But it became, it got out of hand, so much so that it bothered me. And at one point, uh, Tamal Krishna, came up to me and he said, well, Udama, it looks like your group's going to be in the uh, finals. I guess you'll probably win. That's what everybody thinks. And I said, no, I don't think so. And he said, why not? I said, because I'm leaving. I'm not even going to chant. He said, well, why not? I said, because nobody here is into the right mood. They're making it into a political thing. They're, they're at trying to agitate all my men and they're saying that we're into it for you know, non-devotional reasons, which is completely wrong. So as a protest, I'm leaving because nobody appreciates it. And he said, that's not true. Prabhupada appreciates it. And I said, well, how do you know? He said, well, because when you were chanting at your first, the first kirtan, we were up in the room with Prabhupada. And we were just sitting there. We had been sitting with him all day, in fact, for days. And he was just sitting there. He wasn't looking at us. He didn't say a word. He didn't move. His head was down on his knee most of the time. And he was virtually motionless, not responding or anything. 
and your kirtan group came on and you were chanting, and then we looked and I noticed that Prabhupada was tapping his hand in time with the kirtan. He was tapping on his leg or something like that. And then at one point the kirtan reached a crescendo, and, and the women responded as they do in Bengal with that kind of yodeling thing. And it just, just built up, and Prabhupada looked up and he said something like, just see, this is ecstasy. And he said, and we were all just taken aback, because Prabhupada hadn't said anything. But at that point, he said that. He said, so Prabhupada appreciated your kirtan. And I said, okay, I'll stay. The depths of Srila Prabhupada's compassion was something that invoked a mood of surrender from my hard heart how much he was willing to extend himself and sacrifice of himself to give us Krishna consciousness. He was so learned that whatever he spoke was just pure, purely presenting the absolute truth in Toto. That everything was included in every word he spoke. But the compassion and the concern and the love he had for conditioned souls was something that I had never seen before. I lived with several of his god brothers who were also extremely learned. They knew the Shastra. It appeared as he knew the Shastra. But Srila Prabhupada's deep, deep Thank uh -huh.